Oh, hello there. It's me, Austin. You might remember me from such internet mini-films as Snake Eater Parody Greenscreen.avi or Suikoden 4 is the best Suikoden. And I'm here to tell you about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. That's right, the timelines have converged. ExpressVPN is a VPN provider that works to encrypt your internet connection, hide your IP, and protect your private information from others. If you're anything like me and wanna, you know, not feel vulnerable while surfing the internet, ExpressVPN is a service that'll help you feel safe, even on unencrypted Wi-Fi's. It even works on mobile, so you just gotta press a few buttons and you're good to go. I've been using ExpressVPN in order to watch region-locked content on various streaming websites like Netflix, which is a service I already pay for, but can only watch a fraction of the content because of where I live. Let's say I wanna watch Castle in the Sky because yes, of course I do. Just gotta connect to a Canadian IP and there we go, anime. Finally. ExpressVPN doesn't keep data logs with your private info, it's fast as heck and simple to use. So if you're looking for a good way to protect your personal data and want three months free with a subscription, click the link down below to learn more. That's expressvpn forward slash eruption to get started today. Thank you for the sponsor. Now on with the show. Nick, 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 Nick. Halloween got canceled. Uh -huh. And we're back. It's Nickelodeon time again. As we all know oh so well, licensed video games are about as mixed a bag as you can get. In 2018, I made a video covering some of the worst the Nickelodeon brand has to offer and well, we barely scratched the surface. Turns out that no, Jimmy Neutron Jet Fusion was not the bottom of the barrel. And this wasn't either. I'm a dirty boy. Although that's really close. The channel Nickelodeon has been around for such a long time now that there are several decades of not just cartoons, but but video games based on those cartoons that we can pull from. Be it SpongeBob or Ren and Stimpy, there's something for all generations. Or like, you know, Naked Brothers Band, the video game on the PlayStation 2. Why? So yo, it's Austin, and this time around, I've dug not just deeper, but further back into the Nick catalog to find more bad games. Why? Well, as you'll soon find out, I'm cursed. Let's get today started with a game based off a beloved cartoon that I actually grew up with, Rocco's Modern Life, Spunky's Dangerous Day. That's 11 syllables. That's too many. Man, Rocco's Modern Life was such an interesting show. This slice of life cartoon was able to pull off the rare thing back in the day where it was written to appeal both to adults and children. Similarly to Ren and Stimpy, there's jokes that went over my head as a child that are now like, <laughs> Nice. Although Rocco's got announced more class. Just a smidge. While it didn't run for anywhere near as long as other high profile Nickelodeon shows, Rocco's stood the test of time with its strong four seasons, unmistakable style, goofy characters, and I, I mean, who doesn't like Rocco? He's a cute anthropomorphic wallaby who wears clothes that look literally like the 90s. This whole show is essentially the jazz cup design. Zoomers probably don't like it though. Too old. Not enough widescreen. So of course, when Nick was gaining steam in the early 90s, their shows would start to get video games. Ren and Stimpy would get a couple of stinkers, but neither of those are on the same level as Rocco's modern life, Spunky's dangerous day. Oh, fish sticks. There's a lot of reasons that a video game can be bad. Usually it's a case of bad design or broken systems that turn things into an unplayable mess. Sometimes it's just a generic or mediocre romp that doesn't do anything special. There's no serotonin to be found anywhere. But in the case of Spunky's Dangerous Day, it's the entire concept. There's nothing inherently bad about Rocco here. The music totally works and sounds good on the Super Nintendo. It even has voice clips from the show used as samples. Catch Spunky. But picture this, platformer, escort mission, lemmings, all at the same time, but also in levels huge enough to take half an hour. So you're moving Rocco around and trying to clear the way for your boy Spunky to go and pee on the golden hydrants, or uh, just kind of stand on them. Spunky moves around like a lemming. In order to get him to go places, you have to interact with objects, defeat enemies, and generally try to create a path from A to B to him. But Spunky can take damage if anything touches him, and this dude is an unstoppable force. He will move in one direction until he literally cannot anymore. Even if you pick him up, you can only move him left or right in place. That boy has a mind of his own. But a game that's entirely an escort mission isn't exactly very fun. There's cute parts where you can do this cartoony thing where you turn him into a balloon and slap him across a body of water, which by the way, never do that. But it just kind of sucks. If you aren't careful or fast enough, Spunky can backtrack a very long distance and sets you back a huge amount. And in levels that look like this, I'm sure you can understand how I'm feeling. 
Even the password system does this weird thing where you have to manually walk to each letter and jump on it. It's a tedious game with a concept that's not inherently good. Which is a shame because controlling Rocco himself actually feels alright. It could have been a decent platformer, but you know, it's not. It's bad. Well, uh, that blew. But let's stay in the 90s for a bit longer. While Nickelodeon is mostly known for their cartoons and the occasional live action bit, I was always a huge fan of their TV game shows. Unless your name was like Jeopardy or The Price is Right, the game show was on the downswing. <laughs> Look, one of the biggest shows in the genre at the time was Supermarket Sweep, you know they were strapped for ideas. However, Nickelodeon was all about the game show and by targeting kids, they were able to make a killing. Double Dare, Figure It Out, Nick Arcade, Legends of the Hidden Temple, Wild and Crazy Kids, all of these are frankly dope as hell. I remember it being my dream to be a contestant on Nick Arcade. Those kids sucked. She can't get the speed up to get over. Oh! What are you doing, you idiot? But there's only one quintessential 90s Nick game show to me, and it's got the cheesy synthesizer theme to boot. Nickelodeon Guts. <laughs> Oh man, the second I would hear this, I would get pumped to watch a bunch of kids get smacked around by giant paper mache rocks on the aggro crag. Guts was the series of physical challenges and obstacle courses set up with the purpose of finding the very best athlete. Think Ninja Warrior, but for preteens. And not the one where grown ass men snatch you away into the abyss. Purple parrots for life. So what better way to ask kids whether or not they had it than by making a video game based on it. In 1994, the Super Nintendo would be graced by Nickelodeon Guts and oh, my god. It's impossible. Guts is practically the opposite experience of Rocco's modern life. It's a decent idea with awful execution. The controls don't feel correct at all. There's no explanation on what you should be doing with the jumping ball minigames, so you have to figure it out yourself. Not the easiest feat when there's multiple mechanics that don't make any sense. Want to not fail your landing every single time? Turns out you have to charge or jump twice. Would have been nice to know. What about basic platforming? They put Prince of Persia into guts, except somehow made all of the controls worse. How do you mess up basic platforming? If you don't have someone to play it against, it tells you you're playing guts training, which is an eternal reminder that you're a coward and alone, but also good luck reaching the end even in single player. You have to get a certain score in order to qualify for the aggro crag. I tried multiple times, but the controls in the obstacle course are so bad that I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I am unable to beat the baby game for babies. So uh, I, I guess we'll just move on then. Next up is the pinnacle and poster child of Class Supo, and no, I'm not talking about As Told by Ginger. Before SpongeBob, the show that was the most Nickelodeon was Rugrats. Ah, the show about babies that wasn't actually for babies. The show secretly about the stresses of child rearing and the infinite amount of 4am chocolates you'll have to make. I've lost control of my life. Well, that's exactly how I feel after playing any one of the many, many, many Rugrats video games. 20 in total to be exact. That's, that's way too many y'all. These are like the variety spice of life. With all of these games all very different, you never know what you're gonna get. There's platformers, point and click adventure games, mini game collections, and uh, whatever this is. But most of these are pretty much guaranteed to be awful. However, in my head, there's two that always stood above the pack in terms of their badness. Two games that I didn't realize I actually had nostalgia for. Not the good kind. First up is Rugrats Scavenger Hunt for the Nintendo 64. That's a boring game, Tom. I don't know, Chucky. Maybe to win, you have to make everyone be bored. I don't know why, but I remember all of this. Every second. Why? Rugrats Scavenger Hunt is exactly as it sounds. You're put into some scenario where the babies start pretending and your goal is to find pieces of whatever level you're on. And you do this by running through a map and hopefully landing on spaces that allow you to check an object in that room. And it's a high probability you're just gonna find dust bunnies. Straight up dirt. And that's the entire game. Yeah, actually. All you do is move around a map and try to find whatever you need. There's no mini games, there's no competition. Heck, most of the multiplayer modes have you work working as a team against like Angelica. There's just, there's nothing to do here. It's just landing on spaces to hear the same voice clips over and over, all while unearthing the deepest of memories. How did you get here? This is too familiar, I don't like it. 
I was playing for a good bit to see if anything would actually happen in any of these levels, and it felt like 45 minutes when in reality it was only 15. Nice. I then put on the AI only mode to see if anything would happen, and literally nothing happened. Not a single thing. But hey, just so everybody knows, it is apparently better than God Hand. And our next Rugrats video game, Rugrats Studio Tour. No manual price tag on the front, just the way we like it. Developed by InSpace, the people behind the DS Call of Duties and Geist on the GameCube, the only note I wrote down for Studio Tour was Hellscape. I don't know what that meant. Oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Rugrats Studio Tour is a collection of recycled minigames, most of which are all lifted from the previous game, Search for Reptar. Except somehow it's worse in just about every way. The babies are having a group family trip to a movie studio when stupid little brother Dill Pickle somehow winds up in jail. Good going, dumb baby. So get this, a minigame collection with only five game types. You feeling that? What if I told you despite this game being about rescuing his brother, Tommy takes a back seat? Yeah. You in? You're essentially trying to free Dill from jail by playing mini golf, doing awful platforming, doing multiple variants of racing, all while hearing Reptar go rawr every three seconds. <laughs> Add on top of that music loops shorter than Crash and the Boys, and you got yourself a recipe for fun? Question mark? I don't know about you guys, but I sure love Sonic R. Rugrats Studio Tour should have taken a second to learn from Search for Reptar and make something better, but this is the land of licensed video games in the 90s and 2000s we're talking about, probably the worst it ever was. Knowing just how many Rugrats video games were, it's possible that we're just scratching the surface, but no more today. I can only listen to jumbled up babies speak English for so long. <laughs> Next up is a video game based off of a show that wasn't originally on Nickelodeon. Now, I've gotten to talk about a couple of their games in the past, but very, very briefly, but uh, I sure do love me some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. When I think of being a kid, I think of playing Sonic, watching Dragon Ball Z, and making my Star Wars and TMNT action figures fight over whoever got to drive the turtle van. Spoilers, my battle-scarred Wing Zero would win, also known as the time Bandai sold factory defects to children. But Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were the shit. They had dope cartoons, fun movies, singular, and best of all, some great video games. Since I only had a Genesis as a kid, I probably played Hyperstone Heist on a daily basis for a year straight. This co-op beat-em-up stands up there with Streets of Rage 2 for me, and it's one of those games that stands the test of time. Also, the NES game, not that bad. Just real, real hard. Unfortunately, pretty much right after the 16-bit era, a majority of all of the TMNT games would be stinkers. Be it Tournament Fighters, the nearly nightmare fuel out of the shadows, or the complete remake debacle called Reshelled, you could expect hella mediocrity with Don Raff, Mike, and Leo. So, when the highly esteemed Platinum Games teamed up with Activision and were gonna make a full-on four-player co-op action game in the same vein as Bayonetta, I uh, think literally anyone would have been excited. This was, of course, the tail end of the Activision Platinum Games trilogy, which we'll get more into another time, but with TMNT, we had potential. A series that's been mostly bleh in video games for decades could potentially knock one out of the park. This year's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutants in Manhattan, and it has to be one of the most disappointing games I've ever played. <laughs> It's a mess. It's a massive cluster fuck. It's an ambitious attempt that has moments where it really shines through, but overall just falls over on its face. Each of the four turtles has their personality shine through both in dialogue and moveset. You'll work with each other through these long levels in order to tackle several objectives and eventually a boss. And it has that signature platinum combat flair. Just extremely dumbed down and more reliant on mashing special abilities and abusing items as opposed to like playing good. I get that this is technically supposed to be a kid's game, so there's a limit on what they can do with the difficulty and storytelling, but I really expected a lot more from Platinum, considering the licensed game they released prior was Transformers Devastation. Overall, Mutants in Manhattan feels like an extremely dumbed down Anarchy Reigns. It has moments where it shines through, like in boss fights, with more traditional mechanics, but when you're spending 30 to 40 minutes in the same looking sewer doing random missions that pop up, it feels closer to grinding fates in Final Fantasy XIV than being a heroic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. 
And given that it's only like four and a half hours long, there's hardly a reason to stay. You can tell Activision wanted the online multiplayer to be a big aspect of it, considering there's a level system with visible avatars and other online video game things, but Mutants in Manhattan just doesn't have enough depth to justify it. While yes, there are definitely worse TMNT games out there, like four or five even, Mutants falls into a place on the potential slash hype versus mediocrity meter that makes it stand out the loudest. This should have been real good. There's moments where it's real good, but there's no cowabungas coming out of this guy anytime soon. You know what? I'll revisit this with the Activision Platinum 3 sometime soon. Heck, another one of those games could even be in this video. It's not but it's close. And no matter how rough that game might have been, it doesn't come anywhere close to a game in its sister series, Avatar The Last Airbender. And no, I'm not talking about the one that you can get a full achievement score in in like three minutes. I'm talking about one based off the live action film directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Why? There's a lot people say about the last Airbender live action movie and none of it good. In fact, a lot of people consider it one of the worst movies ever made, which is pretty par for the course for McKnighty over here. What? No! Avatar The Last Airbender, the movie, the game, also known as Oh No, was developed by THQ Australia, the dudes who were actually making other Avatar games. This one takes the cake though, mostly because of its attachment to the movie and the fact that they pronounce everything wrong. My name is Ong. I want you, the listener, to imagine all of the great character action games you can. Devil May Cry, Bayonetta, Ghost Rider. Now, take a look at this. <laughs> Clearly, Avatar here has learned from, no, surpassed the greats. The high profile flashy combat has reached a point where I can do huge combos all while checking texts on my phone. Truly, this is the apex of style. Look, there's not even a dodge button. You gotta do that free form. It's all about creativity in Avatar and uh, wiggling the Wiimote. Biah! Yeah, uh, this game kinda sucks. A lot. Well, it looks okay in spots. This is about as movie tie-in on the Wii as a movie tie-in on the Wii can possibly be. It was part of a yearly release schedule. It's a bunch of generic combat arenas and generic puzzle solving. There's the occasional bout of rail shooting, which is easily the best part of the game, but I mean, that's just pointing and clicking. Clicking through your email is just as fun. You can play as Zuko and Ong through a bunch of different levels, but it feels like it has no soul. It's not glitchy. There's not really any way you can get stuck or anything. You're just whacking one, two, three with a Wiimote swing until it's done. Riveting gameplay. Basically, what I'm trying to say is McKnighty's Airbendy video game is not Kino, not even close. It's closer to a collaboration meal at McDonald's, the M. Night Shyamalan filet of fish But is it really fish? All right. We got one more for today and I have a confession to make. I messed up. I did something bad when all I wanted to do was talk about a video game. A couple years ago, I talked about a game that I found pretty bad and terrible and offensive in some ways. And uh, here we are two years later and it has a sequel. This here is Nickelodeon Car Racers 2, a game I pretty sure I accidentally forcibly willed into existence and you all let me know. Please stop tweeting at me about Nickelodeon Kart Racers 2. Some of y'all might have remembered me talking about Nickelodeon Kart Racer, the extremely lackluster racing game without any voice acting, the smallest character roster ever, where a majority of them were just four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. As a connoisseur of kart racing games, I tend to get excited for generally anyone that flops out. Even licensed ones tend to be at least okay. Nick, unfortunately, was not that. So two years later, my arch nemesis, Game Mill Entertainment, teamed up once again with Bam Tang Games to put out a sequel to one of my most disliked games of 2018. Game Mill sure has made a lot of appearances these last few years. What an appropriate name. But this time around, they were gonna up the ante. Instead of 12 characters, we've got 30, including Cat Dog, Danny Phantom, Aang, not Ong, Invader Zim, Rocco, Ren and Stimpy, and Jojo Siwa? Wait, what? Is this this game's Danica Patrick? Beyond playable characters, there's also assists. You can unlock and equip characters from tons of shows to help you do things while racing via boosting, shields, or extra coins. You can customize your ride in a system that feels closer to Mario Kart 8 with its variety. There's even online multiplayer, which puts it at least on the same page as Garfield Kart Furious Racing. But there's still no voice acting.
Even Nicktoons Racing on the PS1 has voice samples. When I think of Nick, heck, when, when I think of cartoons, I think of tons of characters and the weird and asinine things that they say. I think of Cat Dog arguing with itself constantly. But in Nick Kart Racers 2, it's just... Why isn't anyone saying anything? There's also a lack of courses that scream Nickelodeon at you. Sure, there's a couple of tracks that are clearly themed after a show, but most of them are like Variety Theme Park Kart Racing Level Design 101. Like it belongs in All-Star Fruit Racing. Yeah, I played it. What? While all of that is pretty lame, I would say that overall, Nick Kart 2 is a better game than the original. Things have been tightened up. The ability to customize your cart stats leads to me being able to find a control scheme that doesn't totally suck. But it still hits that mediocre game mill feeling. The music feels 100% stock. There's, you're not gonna hear a Rugrats theme. A lot of the character animations look goofy and weird. The AI is still designed like a classic rubber bandy cart racer. So if you do too good, that's too bad. I'm gonna knock you back. It's no fun unless you turn the difficulty all the way down. I think I would give it a little slack if it was the first game, but well, it's not. It's a quickly pumped out sequel that I feel partially responsible for. Like, this is my disappointing child. You tried, I guess. When you get to make a sequel, you get a chance to fix your mistakes. But instead of doing that, they just tossed more characters and one Joe Osiwa in to make a quick buck, continue to rely on the brand Nickelodeon, and did the bare minimum. The only new additions that gave my cold soul a semblance of a smile were some of the power-up items. When the arm reached out and just blocked my view, like covering my eyes, that was good. That was Nick. I liked it. Congratulations, you did it. I guess technically you're better than the first one, but I expect more. Despite clearly having a bigger budget, Nick Cart 2 just feels like a lot more of the same with a shinier coat. But that same is a janky, soulless kart racer, and I don't like it. I guess I'll see you guys in two more years with Nick Cart Racer 3 starring me, probably. Damn it. And that, kids, is why you should be giving a little more respect to Project Cross Zone. At least they would have explained why Jojo Siwa is sitting there drifting next to SpongeBob. That or Jump Force. <laughs> but hey, I guess that's all for today. I didn't realize how many Nickelodeon games would be bad. Apparently the answer is most of them. And then, then, then there's like the whole Nicktoons Unite trilogy or something like that. I know some people have been asking about that, so maybe we'll play that in the future. But for now, today we are done. If there's something specific you guys think I should cover, please let me know down in the comments. Anyways, catch me next time when I play a real survival horror game. I know it's Halloween today, but not today. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Special Patreon thanks to Ryan Talbert, Plasma Phoenix, Nitron, Legend Gary, Kieran Arder, Kevin Zanowski, Josh Garbage Lord, Jordy McCaffrey, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jeffrey Narvaez, Jay Roos, Flaming Fighter, Eli Shane Stauffenecker, David Molnar, Donald Dowdy, D.A. Stevens, Cliff Fro, Christopher Olivia, Chris Shelton, and Brandon Howe. Thank you very much for your generous support. Happy Halloween. Stay inside. Apologies for missing a week, but uh, you know, we're keeping things moving steady forward. And we'll be resuming weekly uploads as soon as possible. So uh hey, you know, take care of yourself. Go eat a go eat some pumpkin pie for me.